and their broadcast. Um, but um, we're going to have to do some things a little different this morning, so be patient with me for a minute, okay? Are you live? Okay, hi. First, got to tell the people that are watching on Facebook, um, in just a few minutes, the Facebook feed is going to go to music only, and um, we need to do that because we need to do some things here for a few minutes that we can't put over Facebook. Um, it's not that we're doing anything bad or mean. It's just uh, um, we, uh, we have uh, some people whose identity we need to protect, and so we're not going to be putting it over Facebook. And so be patient with us and just listen to the music while we do this, and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes, okay? So you guys can go ahead and shift to that. Go to openings. Click on over here on the on start then start your music and then kill the mics. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your Trampled on the ground 
sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear And grace my fears really How precious did that grace appear The hour I first As 
And uh, for those of you that are just rejoining us, we're glad that you're watching and we're glad that you're here. And we just want to continue the service now. We're going to start with a, uh, a song that just talks about the power and the importance of prayer. Let me tell you something. The two people you just met need your prayer. And maybe this song will remind you of how sweet prayer can be. Um, we know that the night before Jesus went to do something that took incredible courage, he went to the garden and he prayed. And that was his answer. Anytime he was stressed, anytime he was struggled, anytime he needed help, anytime he needed courage, anytime he needed anything, he went to his heavenly father in prayer. It's what we're to be about also. So stand with me as we sing in the garden. Will you please? Let's stand together. church you're dismissed he speaks the son's voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known I'd stay in the garden with him though the night around of woe his voice to me is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tell seated. Guys, I'm just going to use the pulpit mic today. I um, want to take a minute for a couple of announcements uh, that we want to take care of real quickly. Um, they, there's, a, there's a couple things that I need to make you aware of. Go on to the first slide, guys. There we go. First of all, a reminder, if you're watching online, go ahead and send your prayer requests in through the comments section, and uh, we'll see that we get those right away. Go ahead. Camp Galilee. We're still pushing Camp Galilee. If your kids haven't signed up for Camp Galilee, uh, the forms are still in the back. You can do that. If you're from this church, it doesn't cost them a dime to go. 
And uh, so that is there. The second thing about Camp Galilee, I guess that's coming down in a minute. Go on to the next one. We need some counselors for primary camp and junior camp is desperately in need of counselors. Um, primary camp is just a weekend camp. It goes the, I don't remember what the dates are. Well, it tells you there. Um, primary camp is July 9th through the 11th. That's just a uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They come back Sunday about noontime, something like that. Uh, so that's, that's that. And then junior camp is a four-day camp, July 25th through the 29th. Um, we are very short on counselors, especially guys. Uh, if you would be willing to help with that, please let us know. Let me know. Um, don't know any more to say about that. Go ahead to the next one. The Bible study will be canceled this week, uh, the online Bible study. And the reason I'm doing that is because Tuesday my dad is having colon cancer surgery. And I need to be up there. There is, my dad doesn't have a great heart. He did pass a stress test, um, but it just took everything out of him to do it. Um, and the doctor has told him, there, you know, you're at high risk in this surgery. And so um, I'm going to be traveling up to Philadelphia tomorrow morning uh, to be there with mom and dad while dad has surgery. Um, so I, I won't, the surgery is on Tuesday. Uh, I'll be going up tomorrow to help get things ready and then getting to the hospital and, and all of that. So we will not be having Bible study this Tuesday. It will resume the following Tuesday. Go ahead. Uh, you all understand what's going on with the tithes and offerings. The plates are still in the back. We still continue to do this. I think we probably can go back to doing offerings a regular way pretty soon, but for now we're just going to do this, and some people are still mailing them in, and some people are still sending them in through the website, But uh, and, and that's fine. You can continue to do that for as long as you want if that works best for you. Go ahead. Um, is the sign-up sheet back there, Christy? For Bible school, okay. Uh, Bible school is going to be August 9th through the 13th. And uh, we are going to get to have Bible school this year. Um, we're, gonna, we're not sure we're going to be able to provide transportation. It might be a little smaller Bible school than what we're used to because we're not going to be able to run the vans maybe yet. But we need people to sign up to help with Bible school. And uh, so we need workers. And so there's a sign-up sheet in the back. And we need people that are willing to sign up to be a worker, to be a teacher, to be a uh, craft, you know, to work in crafts, to work in refreshments, to work in uh, games. Um, we need people for all of those areas. And so if you're willing to help, um, your help is needed. Don't think, well, somebody, you know, here's the thing that always happens. Everybody thinks, oh, somebody will do it. You know, if I don't sign up, somebody will do it. Well, that's not always true. Sometimes... Nobody does it, and we're struggling to try and figure out how to get along without it. So if you're willing to help, please sign up and let us know that you're willing to help. All right? I think that was the last one. Are there any other announcements that I didn't make mention of? All right. Um, some people have asked, are we going to be doing the yard sale? Um, we're going to try and get that in this fall. I couldn't do it this spring. I didn't have the strength in my... I just wasn't able to do it physically yet because um, I have to be on my feet a lot that day and have to be able to lift and carry, and I wasn't ready to do that yet for the spring. But I'm hoping this fall we can go ahead and get that done. Thank you, Patty. She keeps this up here for me. <clears throat> Any other announcements? I want to take a moment for prayer requests. Anybody have any prayer requests this morning? Yes, Surgery to correct the graft in your arm in Morgantown. Bev, okay. Let's keep Bev in your prayers for Wednesday. Um, okay. Wow. Okay. Lucy Vanderwitt. Okay. Also, uh, I think most of you knew that um, Betty Mungold was put back in the hospital. 
Uh, her surgery was successful uh, on her leg. They had to, she developed some infection in that leg, and they had to go in and clean that out. But that all went good. She, there's a possibility that she'll get to come home tomorrow. Depends on what they can work out. Uh, they had to put a, I want to call it a pump, but a wound vac, yeah, a wound vac in. And uh, they have to get it set up where there's a place that they can that can be changed three times a week. And so they're still trying to get that all worked out. But keep Betty in your prayers that all that works out and she's able to get home and, and get everything taken care of. Any other prayer requests? All right, yes. Blake, yeah, Blake's on our prayer list, but... Uh, we want to continue to keep him in our prayers. And uh, I don't know how many of you saw on Facebook, we were talking about this in my Sunday school class, but uh, he really likes getting cards. And so probably next week or so, we're going to organize a little card thing for Blake uh, to send cards out to him. Um, any, any come in? Okay, all right, that's a switch. All right, any unspoken requests? All over the room. Okay. Let's just go to prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm humbled every time that we come to this point in the service or really any time that I come to you in prayer. I'm humbled because I know there's nothing in me that gives me the right to come into the presence of Almighty God. But Father, you've given us that privilege. You've given us that opportunity to come before you. you. In fact, you've told us you desire us to come to you in prayer, not just to lift up our own needs, although you've told us to do that, but we, come, we can come to you in praise. We can come to you in worship. We can come to you in thankfulness. We can come to you as intercessors. And you've challenged us to intercede on behalf of one another, to pray for one another. So, Father, as we've heard these requests this morning, we realize that there are spoken and unspoken requests. And while we may not know all the needs represented in the unspoken requests, Father, you do. And for those spoken requests that have come forth, whether it's for healing, whatever need is represented, Father, we know that you alone are able to meet that need beyond any of our imaginations. So, Father, we lift each of these up. We join our hearts together as a church family today, and we lift these needs up before you, and we ask, Father, that you hear them and that you, Father, meet each one according to your will. Meet these individuals at their point of need. Touch their heart, touch their lives. Guide them if guidance is what's needed, if healing is what's needed. Father, we pray for their healing. If comfort is what's needed, then, Father, grant your spirit of comfort, whatever the need might be. Father, we pray that you might meet that need. And then, Father, we pray that you would be glorified through the answer of the prayer. Father, we lift these up to you, not of our own authority. But we do this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I put a mistake in the bulletin. If you're looking in your bulletin, you'll see where it says it's time for a baby dedication. Nope, that's next week. So next week we'll have baby dedication service. It would have been good to do it on Father's Day, but that's not the way we got it planned out, and that's not the way it worked. Um, so we're going to do it. We're going to do it next week, and so we want to encourage uh, those that are going to be able to do that. So God's blessed us with uh, with bunches of babies here lately, and we're excited about that. Um, that being that being the case, uh, I had planned on going from baby dedication into the sermon without a song because I thought with the one situation and then the dedication it would make the service long. You all won't mind if I make the service a little shorter, will you? All right. So we're going to go to the Word of God here in just a minute. and we're going to, I, I, I wanted to try and do something today that was just going to be an encouragement to fathers. Um, I read something. I read about a a Father's Day card that said, Dad, everything I ever learned, I learned from you, except for one thing. The family car will do 110. Uh, <laughs> so, 
So that's not the card you want to receive. But anyhow, uh, this morning I just want to try and do something that will be an encouragement to Dad. So we're going to look at Genesis chapter 48. We're going to read the first 11 verses. Genesis 48, beginning in verse 1. We're going to read about a dad that wasn't really all that perfect, and yet God used him to be a blessing. It says, Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob was told, Look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up in bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty prepared, prepared me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you and will make of you, and will make of you a multitude of people. And give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. And now your two sons Ephraim and Manasseh who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you before I came to you in Egypt are mine as Reuben and Simeon they shall be mine your offspring whom you beget after them shall be yours and they will be called by the names of of their brothers in their inheritance but as for me when I came from from Padan Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way when there was but little distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. When Israel saw Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, These, they are my sons whom God has given to me in this place. And he said, Please bring them to me and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. Then Joseph brought them near to him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, but in fact God has also shown me your offspring. Will you pray with me for just a minute? Father, Lord, you are the ultimate father. But fatherhood has become complicated in our day. And a lot of dads are really sometimes not sure how to do it and what to do. They're receiving messages that come from all sorts of different directions and some people are expecting perfection while others just want them to stand back and get out of the way. Father, I pray today that this might be a time of encouragement for dads. Father, let your word come forth in the way that they need to hear. And Father, let it be a time where they will receive what they need to receive from you in a way that will be a blessing to them. Move me aside. Don't let me get in the way. But let your message come forth as you desire it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's stressful to be a father today. Maybe it always has been. But some fathers today have jobs that require them to work multiple hours a week, 55, 60, 65, maybe more. And they struggle with figuring out how to spend enough time with their children. Redefining gender roles today have caused confusion in many fathers. Dads are uncertain what's expected of them sometimes because society is saying this and family is saying this and church is saying this and they're just not exactly sure what is the best way to do it. The breakdown in morality creates a stress in our society today. How can we get our children to adhere to Christian morals when they're being attacked every day through the music that they listen to, through the commercials they see on television, through the movies that are out, through every, almost every venue that's out there, they're being told that morals are different today than they were. The media portrays fathers as inept and is very irreverent in the way it puts forth the face of fatherhood. Sometimes at church, added pressure is brought on because the church makes dads feel like they're poor examples, actually sort of beating them up with messages on what a father is supposed to be. Heard about a little boy that came up to a preacher after, the ser after a Father's Day sermon and told the preacher, Boy, that was a good sermon. You had my dad scooting all the way down in the pew. 
Well, my goal is not to beat dads up today, but to encourage dads and build them up. So as we look at the passage today, we see a father who was faced with a lot of pressure. He wasn't a perfect father. His name was Jacob. And he was faced with a lot of problems and was imperfect. Got news for you. Fathers are imperfect. They do stupid things. Maybe like that. <laughs> they can hurt themselves. They can do dumb things. And those failures that are, in, that are in their lives often create pressure from their past. They think about all their failures and they think about what they've done and, and that brings pressure to their lives. But I want you to understand not, ever, not, not any father is a perfect father. Jacob, in our opening scripture, was not a perfect father. He had a very bad reputation as a young man. One day, he was fixing some food. You know the story. He was fixing some food, and he was a good cook. He wasn't the hunter of the family. His older brother Esau was. And Esau had been out hunting but hadn't come back with anything. And he'd been out for a long time and hadn't taken any food with him. And when he got back, he was hungry. And there was Jacob fixing this food. He, was, he had a barbecue going. And Esau came up and said, give me some food. And he said, no, not unless you give me your birthright. And Esau said, what good is a birthright if I die of starvation? And so he gives his birthright, which was a big deal. Gives his birthright as the, uh, as the eldest son over to Jacob. He got swindled out of his birthright over some food. Sometime later, when the father was about to pass on the blessing of the inheritance, his eyes had grown dim, he couldn't see. And Jacob and his mother conspired together to trick his father into believing that he was Esau. And so he went in and he tricked his father to believe that he was the eldest son. And the father gave him the blessing of the inheritance. And when Esau came in to ask for his blessing, the father said, I'm sorry, I've already given it to your brother. I thought it was you. Esau was so mad, he told Jacob, I'm going to kill you. And Jacob had to flee for his life into another country. Jacob's rep reputation in the land of Canaan was that of a schemer, a con man, somebody you couldn't trust. That's the kind of reputation most fathers want to prevent their children from learning about themselves. Jacob didn't have an untarnished reputation and his sons knew about it. Most of you know some things about your dad. You know some things that tells you they're not perfect. They're imperfect. Got news for you. So will you be. Our dads aren't perfect. Our moms aren't perfect. We're not perfect. Why do we expect them to be? We've got to learn to be realistic. There are no perfect fathers. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Don't have unre unrealistic expectations or unrealistic standards about your dad. Be forgiving. The Bible says that we're to forgive one another as God forgave us. That's supposed to be the standard. What if you were forgiven by God with the same standard that you're forgiving your father? How well would that go? So extend some grace. But be discerning too. Remember, you don't have to repeat the offense of your father. You don't have to be like your dad. I had a guy that said, you know, I, there's some things about my dad. He's a good man and I want to be a lot like him, but there's some things about him I don't want to be like. And I'm afraid the apple won't fall, farther from, won't fall far enough from the tree. You know, that, that like father, like son, that that kind of plays itself out. It doesn't always play itself out that way. There's nothing that says that because your dad was tight as bark on a tree and didn't know how to manage his money very good uh, or was a, was a spendthrift and, and just blew money left and right, doesn't mean you have to be like that. Doesn't mean you have to be that kind of person. You can be your own person. Be the person God wants you to be. The Bible says, 
in Proverbs 19.11. A man's wisdom gives him patience, so it's his glory to overlook an offense. You can profit from the mistakes of your dad. And I'm talking to those of us that are still grown. I'm 61 years old. My dad's 90 years old. And he's still making some mistakes. So am I. But I can learn from him. I have the blessing of being able to learn from his mistakes as well as learning from my own so that I don't necessarily follow those same mistakes. And you know what? He's a good father because he shares his mistakes with me. The last time I was up there, we spent hours talking and he told me about some things that he had done as a pastor that he says, I don't know why I did that. I don't know, you know, and he just shared things with me and and taught me things. Taught me things from his mistakes that I still need to learn. I've been doing this pastor thing for a few years now. How many of you knew today is my anniversary at break? Camille. (laughs) The first Sunday I preached at break in June of 1981 was on Father's Day. Today is my 40th year, 40th anniversary at break. Thank you. But you know what? That doesn't mean that I still don't have some learning to do. I'm very good at messing up. If I was going to get an award for anything, it should probably be that. Champion of mess-ups. But I'm so glad that my father is willing to share with me his mistakes instead of hiding them from me so that I can learn from those as well and maybe not make those same mistakes that he made. Fathers face the pressure of trying to be a positive influence at home. This may have been Jacob's greatest pressure. Even though Jacob wasn't, even though Jacob was imperfect, he tried to be the spiritual leader of his family. He tried to be a good example. Did I miss a whole thing? I did. I'll get that after I get this. You know, even though. Uh, He was an old man and his sons were grown. Jacob called all 12 of his sons and he blessed them individually. If you were to read the story of Jacob passing on his blessing to his kids, he called each one of them and he told Reuben, I bless you in this way. And he told Dan, I bless you in this way. And each one of them, he went down through all 12 of them and he pronounced a specific blessing over each one. He wanted to be a positive influence. I've tried to do that with my children. That's a picture of of Aaron and I when we were in Rome on on a trip together. That's Rome in one of the streets in Rome in the background. And I've tried to spend time teaching them good things, but they've also seen some of the negative things about me as well. I've tried to spend time with them and be a positive influence in their lives, but that doesn't mean that I've always got it straight and that I've always done the right thing. Christian fathers feel a lot of pressure to be spiritual influences to their children. And that's hard because they worry about all the stuff that every parent worries about today. They worry about drugs. Is my, is my child going to get drawn into that? They worry about alcohol. Is my child going to get drawn into that? What about my daughter? Is she going to get drawn into sexting? That's when you send naked pictures of yourself over texts. Or is my ch- and, and that's become a big deal. Even Girls that go to church are getting pressured into doing that and they're doing it thinking, i got to do that to be cool. They get drawn into other areas. You're considered an old hag if you haven't lost your virginity before you leave high school. And on and on the thing goes. And dads sit around and they worry about all this stuff. How am I going to protect my child from this? How am I going to teach them? How am I going to impart truth to them so that it's going to protect them from this? And we worry about it. We don't know how to bless our children and keep them walking in the way of the Lord when the world is screaming so loud to do something different. Gary Smalley wrote a book some time ago. 
called The Blessing, in which he encouraged modern families to pass on spiritual blessings to their children. He said that it's more than just taking them to church and praying with them, but it's more than even setting a good example. And he talks about five practical ways that we can pass on blessings to our children. And I wanted to share those with you because I think they're so good and so meaningful and so powerful. Number one is a meaningful touch. And if you look at the story of Jacob, Jacob embraced and kissed and laid hands on his children, on his sons and grandchildren, and he, and he wanted to know they were. He wanted them to know that they were a blessing. He laid his hands on them and, and about the shoulders, and he he encouraged them and and just let them know by his touch that they mattered to him. Some people find it very comfortable and very easy to give a hug. Others don't. But your child needs to feel your touch. Give meaningful touch. Second, Smalley said, we pass on a blessing through verbal affirmation. Children need to hear their dad say, I'm proud of you. And not just hear their dad say, you idiot. Can't you do anything right? We can't be the dad that just criticizes in trying to correct us all the time. We have to be the dad that also encourages by saying, I'm proud of you. And boy, you did a good job at that. I, you, that was great what you just did there. You might say, well, I feel awkward doing that. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You're not doing it for you. Thirdly, you might pass along, a, you, you, we pass along a blessing by attaching value. To bless means to honor. We honor our children by letting them know that they're valuable to us. If all your children ever hear is how unvaluable, that's not even the right word, but uh, how valueless they are to you, how much they've messed up and they never hear from you, how valuable, how you would do anything for them. And every father in here, I know that describes you. Every father in here, I know you would do anything to keep your children safe. But if they never hear from you how valuable they are to you, it's hard for them to get that in their heart that that's really true. Fourth, we pass along blessing by picturing a positive future for them. Jacob pronounced a positive future on Reuben and Judah and Dan and Asher and all the others if you read through his blessing that he placed on each one. He said, he, t he told each one of them, not only uh, am I proud of you, but here's what I see you're going to be able to do in the future. Here's the character trait I see that stands out in your life that makes you something special. And he did that with each one of his children. You know, there's nothing wrong with looking at your children and saying, you know what, I see how great you are with animals. I bet someday you might be a great veterinarian. Maybe somebody did that with Bill once upon a while upon a time and all of a sudden there he is a veterinarian I don't know if that's how it worked with him but but you know there's nothing wrong with saying you, you know you're so great with talking to people someday you I, I can just see you working with people and making a real difference in people's lives nothing wrong with dreaming with your kids and sharing their dreams and encouraging their dreams the fifth way Smalley said we bless our children is by active commitment. You know, it's not enough to speak words. There has to be a willingness and a parent to sacrifice for their child, to pray, to spend time in, in helping them develop their gifts, to spend money for lessons or on higher education. We have to be willing to sacrifice a little bit, and most parents understand that. You know, to be honest, many men find it difficult to do some of those things, to verbalize how they're feeling and to pass on blessings. So I want to speak to moms for just a minute. Sometimes, moms, you can be the one that helps out here. Sometimes you can be the one that goes to your child and says, man, I wish you could have seen your dad's face when you walked, up, walked out on that stage. He was so proud of you. And you should have heard how, how your dad was talking to his friend the other day and bragging on you and telling him how proud he was of you. 
You can help your dads, you can help dads out there a little bit. I want to read something to you. I tried to figure out if I could tell this story, and I figured out that I couldn't tell it as good as I could read it, so I'm going to read it to you. It says, When my sons were little, we used to join hands and have prayer at the end of the day. Then I'd give them a kiss good night. When my youngest son was about nine years of age, he got into bed one night and said, Mom, I can't remember if Dad kissed me good night or not. So she went down and told her husband, that, he had, that what her son had said, that he couldn't remember if he had kissed him goodnight. So the father tiptoed up the steps and bolted through the door like he was a monster, dove into bed and wrestled with him and tickled, it, and tickled him. We laughed and I kissed him. And then we just laid there in the darkness for about 15 minutes and talked about all sorts of things. It was one of those rare special moments with your child. The next night he got into bed and said, Mom, I can't remember if Dad kissed me goodnight or not. So she went downstairs and told her husband, and he did the same thing. Went upstairs, burst through the door, bounded into bed, wrestled and tickled and laughed him. And every night for weeks that went on. As soon as we'd say amen after their evening devotions, he'd run from me and get in bed and say, Dad, you didn't kiss me goodnight. And I'd have to come and jump in bed and wrestle and carry on. It was a ritual. I knew it had to come to an end someday, but enjoyed it while it was lasting. One night, I was in his room, and we were wrestling and carrying on. I finally said goodnight and walked out and walked by his older brother's room and said, Good night, Russ. He said, Good night, Dad. And I got to thinking, every night, Russ hears us laughing and carrying on in the next room, and I go by and just say good night. Maybe he'd want me to do that to him. So I bolted through his room, jumped in his bed, and started wrestling with him, nearly got whipped. It settled down, and I decided it was time for me to express how I felt. I have to be honest, I have a hard time saying to a person individually sometimes what I want to say. I said, Rusty, I want you to know how proud I am of you, and how special I think you are, and I want you to know that I love you. He said, okay, Dad, no big thing. But I felt better because I had expressed it. The next morning as I was walking by his room, Russ said, Dad, could you come in here a minute? I went in, and he hemmed and hawed for a bit, and pawed the floor, and said, Dad, thank you for coming in last night. I never get too old for that. If your dad does something right, tell him. Just like he needs to do with you. He needs that encouragement. He's so used to doing things wrong, and, letting, and, and having people tell him about that, he could use a word of encouragement when he does something right as a dad. I'll guarantee he'll remember it. You have no idea how much your father loves you, even though it's difficult to express. I want to just go quickly to this. Go back to the slide about fathers face pressure in providing for their families. Jacob had 66 people in his family he was trying to provide for. The Bible says in Genesis 30, 43, Jacob grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks and maid servants and men servants and camels and donkeys. He had a lot of money till a family, till a famine hit the area, and all of a sudden the money was gone. He had to send his sons to Egypt, and you know the whole story about how his one son was already down there and been raised to that position of authority. A major pressure for the dads feel today. They want to feel, they want to create a feeling of security in the home. But with the downsizing of a lot of situations and businesses, there are a lot of dads who live in constant pressure of trying to make ends meet. It hurts as a dad when you can't provide what you feel you need to provide for your family. That's why many dads get defensive and testy when you talk about financial matters in the home because they feel like they've failed in this area somehow. One of the best ways to help relieve that stress and be supportive is just to show gratitude for what they do do.
I heard about a father who had two children. He set aside $10 every week, and that was just money for entertainment. It wasn't a lot, but it was what he could afford. He set aside $10 every week, and they could get in the bag until the $10 was gone to go to Dairy Queen or to go to the swimming pool or whatever. But the $10 would soon run out. He went to his wife one day and he said, you know, $10 isn't much. Maybe I could put a little bit more in the entertainment bag. She said, no, don't do that. She said, we don't have a lot. And said, our kids need to learn sometimes to do without. I want to say something that's not very popular today. Because dads get so busy or they have so many resources that they feel guilty Maybe they're so busy they don't spend a lot, a lot of time with their kids so they tried to make up for it with money. But I want to tell you something, the greatest disservice you can do to your children. Hear me on this, dads and moms. The greatest disservice you can do to your children is not to let them struggle once in a while. If all you do is hand over money because you've got it in hand, and you don't let them struggle a little bit and learn to appreciate the value of working and the value of meeting needs and the value of a dollar and how, how hard a dollar is to come by. You do a great disservice to your children. I've had this conversation with some dads that learned it too late. And their kids grew up and saw dad as an ATM. Never learned the value of how hard their dad or mom had to work to come up with that money. And then when they finally got hit in the face with it, they didn't know how to handle it. Nothing wrong with saying no once in a while and letting your children struggle a little bit. It'll build character. doesn't mean you don't love them. This father, Father's Day came around. And his kids had been saving a little bit of money out of each week's $10. And Father's Day came around and they had saved enough to take Dad out to a nice restaurant out of the $10 that he had been providing. They appreciated what he had done. There's no question that you love your children. Most people would never question that. Patrick Morsey tells a story. It's, called, it's in a book called Man in the Mirror. He tells a story about a family that went on a fishing trip. It wasn't a family, excuse me. It was three men and the one man's son. It was a 12-year-old son. They went on a fishing trip up in Alaska and they went in there by seaplane. Seaplane landed and it was tied up next to the shore. They had been fishing and at the end of the day, they went back to get in the plane to fly out and here the tide had gone out and the plane was grounded. There was nothing they could do but wait till the next morning to when the tide had come in and lifted the plane off the rocks so they could fly out. The next morning, they got in the plane and they started out across the bay to take off and here as the plane had sat on the rocks, one of the pontoons on the plane had got punctured and it filled with water and drug the plane down until the plane crashed in the water. They, jumped in the, they all jumped in the water and began to swim for shore. Two of them, all three of the men were strong swimmers. Two of them got there quickly, even though there was a strong riptide that was trying to pull them out. But when they turned around and looked, even though the, father, the third father was a strong swimmer, his son couldn't make it. And rather than leave his son to be dragged away, he, could, he tried to pull him in and couldn't do it. Rather than leave his son to be swept away by the riptide, he stayed there with his son as they were both swept out to sea. He would not leave his son to save his own life. There's a fact that most kids don't know. We love our children so much, we would die for them. Matt, did you ever think you could love something so much until your child was born? It kind of surprises you, doesn't it? They'll turn into teenagers later and that'll change. 
No. It never gets to a point where we wouldn't die for our kids. And I know if I asked every father here, if you had been in that dad's position, would you have done anything different? And you would all say no. The Bible says, greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Well, that's multiplied even more for your children. So dads, be encouraged today. You're not perfect. We don't expect you to be. But you are making a difference in the lives of your children. Love them, be an example to them, encourage them, strengthen them. Do all that you can. And when you can't do it all, when the pressure seems like it's too much, remember Jacob. His 12 kids became the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. This was a man who at one time had been a swindler and a cheat. That was Aaron's wedding. I looked for other pictures of other fathers, and I thought, you know what? I just want to use me this time. Because you all know me, I'm not perfect. I've made a lot of mistakes with my kids. But they both love Jesus. And they're both doing okay. Yours will too. Just do your best to be what God calls you to be and don't let the pressure overwhelm you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the ultimate Father. You are the Father that we wish we could emulate. But Father, most of us are more like Jacob. We've messed up and sometimes the pressures tend to overwhelm us. But Father, challenge us to just continue to try to, be, to do what we can to be the Father that our children need us to be. And Father, for those of us that are still blessed enough to have our fathers with us, help us to be an encouragement to them and not a discouragement. Help us to lift them up. Help us to be a blessing in their lives. Now, Father, thank you for this day. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I get too far ahead and mess up, Josie, go get that box, please, and bring it up to Camille in the back, would you please? There's a small gift for all the fathers that are here today, and I'm going to let Camille go back there and get it ready. Um, let's see. Let me have... We don't have too many of our youth here. Once you got, once you go back and help pass that out, just go back and see Camille. Where, where, where's the? Where, who else can help with this? Go, Hayden. Yeah. Go. You guys take care of it. Don't we have any of our girls here today? Sierra, Sierra back there someplace. Okay. All right. Anyway. Okay, let's see her help too. So dads, when you leave today, there'll be a little gift for you. It's nothing big, but uh, I hope you enjoy it. I hope, well, I'll just leave it at that. All right. You know, I'm not fishing for this. I'm not fishing for this. But I want you to remember this. The first Sunday I was here, 40 years ago, I tried to find the sermon I preached. I thought, boy, it'd be cool to preach that sermon all over again. I have no idea what I preached. I have no idea where it was at. I haven't been able to find it. It probably wasn't very good anyhow. I was 22 years old, wasn't a father, and I was trying to tell fathers how to be fathers. In fact, the first series of sermons I did was on parenting. What a 
arrogant idiot I was. How did you guys put up with... Anyway, I think back of that and think, boy, they're just sitting back there thinking that poor dumb boy, he'll learn. But I remember that first Sunday I preached to fathers. And most of the fathers of the church came and knelt at the altar to pray for their children. And I thought, I remember standing here and praying, God, if the fathers of this church will keep doing that, there's no limit to what this church can be. We're going to sing our closing song this morning. It's called, This Is My Desire. And I'm going to ask Kylie, will you come and lead? It's in I Sing. Yeah. I listened to it this morning. It's not that you can't find it? No, that's not it. See? (laughs) You know what? Pick one. I don't know what we're going to sing, but Kylie, you come up and lead it. Dads, we're not going to be perfect but we can ask God to make us the best we can be. And we can ask for His self, His help, and His strength. For those of you that feel comfortable enough to do it and you want to do it, don't come just because you feel like you're pressured to do this. You can do it from your pew. You can do it from here at the altar. But as we sing this closing song, I give you my heart. Let's Let's come and pray for our families. Let's stand together. This is my desire to
Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we just thank you for all the fathers who are able to be here today um, and all the children who are able to be in our church and look up to the fathers. Um, Lord, we just pray that you would continue blessing over the fathers who are here and all the families who come. Um, Lord, let them be a blessing to us and the church and those who don't have fathers to look up to, Lord. And we just pray that you would give everybody strength and wisdom and the courage to go out and share your word, Lord, and just be faithful servants of yours. Lord, we ask your blessing on us today as we leave this place and your safety throughout the week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.